Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Commander's Horse Studio. Welcome to the show. So, on today's episode, I've got a brand new deck tech for you on Rada. Now, which Rada, you ask? We're going to stay tuned to find out. Actually, you probably clicked on the thumbnail to see this episode. You definitely clicked on the thumbnail, so you know which Rada it is. Let's jump into it. So, the ground rules for my deck techs are as follows. The budget is $50 or less, and that's an overall deck cost. So, that cost includes shipping, as well as commanders, as long as they're $10 or less, but basic lands will not be included in that price. On my deck text, I'm going to take you through the strategy, the tactics, and how the deck wins. So, today's episode is actually a patron-selected deck tech. Once a month, patrons vote on what commander that they'd like to see in an upcoming episode. The commander that gets the most votes, wins. And the commander that they selected was Rada Heart of Keld. Rada is a 3-3 elf warrior that costs 1 red green. As long as it's your turn, Rada Heart of Keld has first strike. You may look at the top card of your library anytime and may play lands from the top of your library. And by paying 4 red green, Rada gets plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the number of lands you control. So Rada is all about lands and land value. Being able to play lands off the top of your library is a very valuable thing. It's essentially an extension of your hand that helps you not miss land drops and helps you know what's coming next. And if you've got ways to play multiple lands in a turn, then this is also going to really come in handy. The other part of Rana is her focus on combat. She has first strike only on your turn though, and that's incentivizing you to attack with her. And you can also pump her based on the number of lands that you control, and in this deck, that's going to be a lot. So the strategy for this deck is pretty simple. We're going to ramp, ramp, and ramp some more to get an absurd number of lands in play. Again, we're going to benefit from landfall triggers, and Rana becomes an even bigger threat. So how do we win with this deck? Well, we can win through some landfall value or smack our opponents with Rana. We've got ways to double up Rada's damage, so once we have 8 lands in play, she can turn into a one-shot kill if we can get her through. And as always with these deck techs, I'm going to take you through 10 different tactics that show you how this deck works and how we're going to win with it. So now let's get things started off with tactic number 1, aptly named, Landed. And as always, first up, there's the actual star of the show with Wayfarer's Bobble. It can get you a land out on turn 2, and that's exactly what we want to do. Some other turn 1 plays come with Fauna Fertility, which is basically Enchant and Wayfarer's Bobble in green, and Search for Tomorrow, which is a fantastic card that you can suspend on turn 1 and get a free land on turn 3. Some great turn 2 plays in this deck come with Sakura Tribe Elder, Rampant Growth, and Edge of Autumn, all of which get you a basic land in a play tapped. And you can even cycle Edge of Autumn by sacrificing a land. And then we've got Cultivate, which gets you 1 basic in your hand and 1 into play. Harrow gets you 2 into play, but you gotta sacrifice 1 land, and Spring Bloom Druid does the exact same thing as Harrow, but those lands come into play tapped. Next up, we've got three very flexible spells with Grow from the Ashes, Migration Path, and Vastwood Surge. Grow from the Ashes can get us one basic going to play untapped or two if we kicked it. Migration Path can be cycled or get us two basics going to play tapped. And Vastwood Surge can get us two basics going to play tapped. And if we kicked it, we put two plus one plus one counters on each creature we control. You might be noticing that Wizards is making more and more explosive vegetation type cards that do extra things. I may be critical of Wizards at times, so I might say a lot of times, but I actually like these cards, so good job, Wizards. My heartfelt words to wizards aside, though, let's move on to tactic number two, extra acreage, where we talk about more ways to get lands into play, because acres, lands, get it? First up, we've got some ways to get an additional land or two into play with Enter the Unknown, Explore, and Journey of Discovery. On top of that, Enter the Unknown lets target creature we control explore. Now, Explore might not be the most memorable mechanic, but it is very effective in the stack. Basically, if the top card of your library is a land, it goes into your hand. That's pretty easy to remember. But if it's not, you put a plus plus one counter on that creature that explored, and then you can put that card back on top or into your graveyard. So depending on what's on top, either draw or plus plus one counter and surveil one. Super easy to remember. Anyways, because Rada lets us know what's on top, we always know what we're going to get with this. And then Explorer is a bit simpler, letting us play that extra land and then drawing us a card. And Journey of Discovery is flexible, letting us get two basics or put two lands from our hand into play, or we can do both if we pay the entwine cost. Next up, we've got some artifacts that can help us out with Explorer Scope, Druidic Satchel, and Gear 4 Ori. Essentially, both Explorer Scope and Druidic Satchel can get lands off the top of our library into play, which again really works well for Rada since we know it's on top. And Gear 4 Ori lets everyone play an additional land on their turn and draw some cards if they have none in hand. Now, this is an effect that does help everyone, but it can really help us, and unfortunately, a lot of the additional land permanents are expensive, so we work with what we have. 
Finally, Cromp Rotation lets us sacrifice one land to get another, and Colony Heart Expedition has landfall. Basically, once it gets three counters on it, we sacrifice it, and then we go get two lands and put them in play tapped. But of course, in a Lands Matters deck, we're not quite done with lands with just two tactics, so let's move on. So now let's move on to tactic number three, Excess Land. And of course, in this tactic, we're going to be talking about X spells with Animus Awakening, Kamal's Riddick Val, and Nahiri's Lithoforming. Both Animus Awakening and Kamal's Juridic Val can get us a ton of lands off the top of our library and put them into play untapped. Well, Animus Awakening puts them into play untapped if we have Spell Mastery, which is kind of a weird mechanic. But basically, we need two instants and or sorceries in our graveyard, then we untap those lands. And then Nahiri's Lithoforming is actually a new one from Zendikar Rising. It makes us sacrifice X lands, and for each land sacrificed this way, we draw a card. Then we can play X additional lands this turn, lands we control enter the battlefield, tap this turn. Again, this one works great with our commander because even if we didn't draw into enough lands, we can actually just keep playing lands off the top of our library for those additional lands as long as they're on top. So as I mentioned before, knowing what's on top of your library is a very valuable thing. And because you can do this at any time, you can really mess with your friends. When they're about to cast a big spell, just say, hold on and look at the top card of your library as if it's going to impact the game, even though you know it's not going to. And then just put it back down and be like, okay, go ahead. You know, deception and lying, things friends do. Anyways, moving on. So we're at tactic number four, here to there. So in this tactic, we're going to be talking about cards that get lands from your hand directly into play, or ones that do the exact opposite. So first up, we've got some turn one plays with Arboreal Grazer, Elvish Pioneer, and Crows and Wayfarer, each of which get a land into play from either entering the battlefield or sacrificing them. But some fantastic repeatable tab effects come with Sky Shroud Ranger, Land War Scout, and Walking Atlas that do the same. These can be really impactful throughout the game, essentially getting you an extra land drop. So, pro tip, with Rada, use the lands on top of your library as your land drops for the turn, and any lands in your hand, save those for these kinds of cards. A slightly worse version of these, but still very effective in this deck, is going to be Firebrand Ranger. First off, you have to pay a green to tap it, and you can only put basic lands from your hand into play. But a creature that can really help with landfall synergies is Living Twister, because it allows you to pay a green to return a tap land you control back to its owner's hand. So you put the land back in your hand, then you use something to bring it back into play, and then you put it back in your hand, and so on and so forth, and yeah, you get a lot of landfall triggers with this in play. And on top of that, you can discard land cards to ping things if you need to. Just wanted to make sure I mentioned that to cover my bases and avoid any unnecessary comments. In the meantime, make sure you comment below to let me know everything that I've messed up so far. But with that being said, let's move on to the next tactic with digging in. And with this tactic, we're going to be talking about digging down into your deck. Because, you know, lands and digging. Very clever, right? Anyways, first up, there's Faithless Looting, which lets us loot twice, and then it's got flashback so we can loot again. And then Thrill Possibility both make us discard one to draw two. So it's not exactly looting since you're drawing more, so kind of, but maybe ditching? Let's go with that. Not even joking, let me know if there's an actual term for this. Anyways, Cathartic Reunion is an even bigger version of this, discarding two to draw three. Next up, there's Harmonize, which lets us just draw three cards because, yeah, green gets to do everything. Next up, there's Escape to the Wilds, which lets us Impulse draw five, and then we can play an additional land this turn. If you haven't heard the term Impulse draw, basically we have temporary access to those cards. And then there's Seer Sundial, which is Landfall, Pay Two, Draw. So if we're in a pinch, we can utilize our lands coming into play to draw some cards. And finally, there's Dryad Greensinger, which works fantastically with Rada. Again, we always know what's on top of our library, and if we've already played all of our lands for the turn, we can just decide to put that land on top into our hand. It essentially helps us get rid of dead draws off the top. But aside from getting things off the top of our library, we can get them back from, well, elsewhere. Where is that elsewhere exactly? Well, let's find out in tactic number six, remember when. It's the graveyard, did you guess that? Anyways, Wild Streams and Reap the Pass can get us back a ton of cards from our graveyard. Both of these are X spells, and Wild Streams gets us back targeted cards, and Reap the Pass gets us back random cards. With the amount of mana that we can pump into each of these, we can get a lot of card advantage off of this. But now that we've talked about getting our things back, how do we deal with our opponent's things? Let's talk about those ways now in tactic number seven, Simplify. First up, there's Broken Bond, which is a great card for this deck. It's going to destroy target artifact or enchantment, then let's put a land from our hand onto the battlefield. So an extra land drop and dealing with a pesky permanent, yeah, that works really well in this deck. Speaking of dealing with pesky permanents, we're also going to be running Return to Nature, Unravel the Aether, and Glamour, each of which can deal with artifacts and enchantments. On top of that, Return to Nature can exile card from a graveyard, which can really come in handy against certain decks. And then Unravel the Aether and Glamour actually don't destroy anything, they make them shuffle it, which can actually be more effective. This gets around indestructibility, as well as any kind of graveyard-centric decks that can just bring it back. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about lands, we've talked about dealing with things, but... What's kind of the end goal? What are we actually just doing other than just getting a lot of lands into play? Well, I'm glad you stuck around to find out, starting with tactic number eight, land a hand. And yes, I know the actual phrase is land a hand, with an E. Moving on, first up, we've got our two retreats with Valakut and Kazandu. Both have those normal landfall retreat choose ones, if you're familiar with the retreat cycle. Retreat to Valakut says target creature gets plus two plus zero until end of turn, and target creature can't block this turn. 
So this can come in handy in multiple ways, pumping Rana further and also making it so that she can get through. If an opponent only has a few creatures on board, it's not going to be uncommon for us to be able to make her unblockable. And then Retreat to Kazandu has put a plus one one counter on target creature or you gain two life. So again, this can make Rada either bigger, but this time permanently, or it can also help us pad our life total. Speaking of padding life totals, we've also got Jaddy Offshoot and Grazing Gladeheart. Both have landfall, Jaddy Offshoot lets us gain one, and Grazing Gladeheart lets us gain two. Now, padding our life total is great, but it's not going to win us the game. So, let's move on to some things that will in tactic number 9, land a friend. So, first up, we've got some landfall creatures that ping with Spitfire Legac, Tunneling Geopede, and Cozy's Ravager. Spitfire Legac and Tunneling Geopede ping each opponent for 1, and Cozy's Ravager just pings one opponent for 1, but it can still be pretty effective in the right situation. If someone's low, we can utilize all those landfall triggers to take them out for the finishing blow. Next up, Akuam Hellkite is also a targeted approach. It says whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, it deals 1 damage to any target, but if that land is a mount, it deals 2 damage to that permanent or player instead. So this can take out creatures as well as players, and again, if they're mountains, it's going to deal double the damage. And speaking of creatures, we've got two landfall creature triggers. Yeah, let's go with that. Spore Mount and Zenikar's Royal. Spore Mount makes 1-1s, one and Zenikar's Royal, strictly better, makes 2-2s. Two but there is a card that stands above the rest in this deck, and that is going to be the Golden Pig of the deck. For those of you that haven't heard, the Golden Pig is the number one card out of the 99. And the Golden Pig of this deck is Rampaging Baylos. Rampaging Baylos is a 6-6 beast with trample that costs 4 green green, and it has landfall. Whenever land enters battlefield under your control, you may create a 4-4 green beast creature token. 144 in Commander, not a big deal. An army of 44s, yeah, that's gonna take out some opponents. And with this on the battlefield, it's not gonna take you long with all those landfall triggers to make your giant army. If you're set up correctly, this can turn the game into your favor in just one turn. The amount of value that it can give you is incredible, and that's why it's the golden pig. But as I mentioned before, if our landfall triggers aren't enough to win, Rada can take over. So now let's find out how in tactic number 10, land a blow. First up, there's Teamer Battle Rage, which is going to give a creature double strike and trample the majority of the time that we use it. Let's just say, for example, oh, I don't know, we have eight lands in play. We use six lands to pump Rada, now she's an 11 11, then we use the remaining two lands to cast Teamer Battle Rage, now she's got double strike, so yeah, she's in for 22, and she's got trample. Again, this is an instant, so we can use it as a combat trick. So if our opponent chose not to block or had no blockers, they're dead. Another flexible card that can be very effective in this deck is Footfall Crater. First off, it's got cycling, so if we don't need it, we can ditch it. And secondly, let's one of our lands tap and gives target creature trample and haste until end of turn. And trample and haste can be very effective with our commander. And then there's canopy cover, which can protect Rada and help her get through. It's going to give her hexproof, although the oracle text doesn't say that for whatever reason. And it also makes it so that she can't be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach. So if one of your friends plays Angel Tribal, have fun with that. And finally, we've got some artifacts that can help her get through as well. Hot Soup, Prowler's Helm, and Key to the City. First up, Hot Soup, extremely flavorful card, thank you James Ernest, makes it so that a equipped creature can't be blocked, and whenever equipped creature is dealt damage, destroy it. So as long as Rada isn't pinged, she's fine. And then Prowler's Helm makes her unblockable except against walls, so unless you're up against an Arcades Strategist deck, you're fine. And Key to the City makes her unblockable at the cost of discarding a card, and you can also loot with it by paying two. Regardless, with the amount of ramp that you have in this deck, Rada can hit hard and hit fast. So if your landfall value doesn't win you the game, Rada will. Anyways, a huge thanks again to my patrons for picking Rana and supporting this channel. I truly couldn't do this without you. But now that we talked about all these spells in this deck, let's talk about how our deck stacks up when it comes to price in the price breakdown. The average Rana Heart of Keld EDH rec deck is going to set you back $461.72. Our deck is going to be much more affordable than that, coming in at $33.70. And for those of you that have been asking why I've been doing seemingly random budget mounts lately that are under $50 and not quite there, here's why. I'm just trying to show that you can make an effective deck on pretty much any budget. Some commanders lend themselves to be more expensive, and others lend themselves to be more budget-friendly. But anyways, with that additional money that you're going to be saving on this extra budget deck, let's look at some reasonable upgrades. First up, let's add in Phylath World Sculptor by taking out Akuam Hellkite. Next up, let's add in Summer Bloom by taking out Jaddy Offshoot. And then let's add in Valakut Exploration by taking out Dryad Greenseeker. Next up, let's add in Mina and Den Wildborn by taking out Grazing Gladeheart. And then let's add in Scoot Swarm by taking out Cozy's Ravager. And finally, let's add a Nesting Dragon by taking out Teamer Battle Rage. And with that, this show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know if you've seen my shaver. I clearly haven't shaved in a while. Yes, I have a beard now. Let me know if you've seen my shaver. So yeah, just, just do that. Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks again, and have a good one.